Yeah, so I, yeah, so I, I put a little current starve on this, and basically this is just a knob that does what's called a current divide, and it, it, it lessens the amount of power that's going through the unit. I mean, I was unemployed, and I had all this cool, like, synth gear, and, like, I sold it all just, just to pay the bills, and I got this dinky little Casio keyboard. This is a, a stylophone. This is like the digital version of, of an instrument that was actually made in the 60s. I'm not gonna get all into it and edit it forever on a computer or do MIDI or anything. It's just gonna be real simple and, and sort of a statement against like how it's cool to be a gearhead and hardware is so much cooler than software and all this. Who fucking cares? It's bullshit. Just make music. So this is like the reboot of it. Um, so it has all these really cheesy like digital samples. Right, it's got these really stupid scratching samples. I would say tweaking and tampering the current pathways of electricity via an instrument or an analog instrument and kind of rerouting those pathways to create a new secret sound. And I think they had a beatboxer. One, two, three. I saw like, you know, I could make music out of anything like before I wanted more and more better expensive gear and now I'm like the other direction like capturing something that maybe like people haven't thought of have discounted and making it powerful. So as I do that, um, all these goofy sounds then start to change. So I make them go really low and then their character starts to really be altered and now what if i could make you know use circuit bending to learn about electronics and modify it and now the music has so much more capabilities as well as starting from this different place i get it really low <laughs> For me, this stylophone is like terrible by itself, and it's really good. The qual after it's circumvented, the quality of the sounds it makes after it's been messed with is like far greater. Circuit bending's like this. Circuit bending is engineering. Circuit bending is not an art. Re-engineering, I guess, even, but yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's definitely a piece of an art form. It's, it's something that you do to create art. Although the instruments you create are works of art in and of themselves, the ultimate goal of the circuit bend is to eventually incorporate that into music in some way. So it's like a work of art that you're making for a work of art. There are trends, like things that they that the circuit might do. And so, if anything, the, those would be like the hypotheses. But you never know, really know which ones you're gonna get out of the circuit. And, and yeah, I, I'd like to do it with a little bit more science. So you get the toy, you open the toy up, and once you look at the circuit board, you kind of get a general idea of what's going on inside of it. But you don't really know like, oh, I'm gonna be able to put a probe on this end and pro on this one with a potentiometer in the middle and I hypothesize that it's going to make a logarithmic swirl. That just is not the case. Uh, so there really is no way to put a hypothesis together, and in order to be a science, you need to do that. That's definitely not a science. It's, I guess it's an art, a folk art, or a artistic practice, I guess. Um, but, you know, it, see, ah, you get the fucking camera in my face now. <laughs> It's a craft, it's a hobby, it's fun. It's a great way to use your time. Like it's, you know, obviously the intersection between all those things. And because we're all equipped with different skills from all of those areas, depending on our own experiences and desires and visions, we all approach it from a different way. It's interdisciplinary, that's, that's what I'd call it. 
So circuit bending is a way that you take old electronics, you pull them apart, you take out the circuit board, you dissect the circuit board, and then you find a way to manipulate the current state of the circuit board so that you can create a new sound that wasn't originally intended for what you're working on. I like to use stuff that's kind of um, just been discarded because, I don't know, I like it. It has kind of like a history to it. You know, it's, um, it's kind of like giving a new life to something that was never designed to have much of a life to begin with. Just everything about it, man, the way you do it and the aesthetic, how these things look, like why does your toy have a bunch of knobs on it, you know? What's, what's, what's that thing doing? Zoom puts these things out like every year. It's like a big money maker for them and they're terrible. <laughs> they're, they're, for, what, for what it's designed to do, uh, it's not really meant to be something that is high quality. It's meant to sell to basically like teenage boys so they could uh, emulate whatever guitar hero um, is popular at the time and then, you know, throw it away in a couple years. In a sense, like with electronic music, like everything is a toy with a bunch of knobs, but you could be that, that guy with like the custom dirty, hairy handgun. That's like, that's what I want. That's what we're making here. It's like, we're, we're making some shit that like James Bond, PPK, like, oh, only one man I know uses this. I like that the uh, um, connection with, with the objects and, and the history of, of the objects, right? Because it's not just um, something that gets made. Someone put their life and effort into making this, right? This stuff's made in, in factories. The factories, you know, have people that work in them and a lot of the conditions are, are really terrible, right? So someone probably was injured um, making this thing, right? And here we are just chucking it away going like, screw that Zoom 505. Like, no, don't screw that Zoom 505. Someone's mom, like, probably, you know, developed leukemia making that. There's value in that. Unscrewing the thing when the screws come off. Here. Look at that, dude. That's weird. If it runs off of 9 volts, I don't have any other power supplies that have 9 volts. So this thing isn't going to do anything. Might be another salvage job. There's a connection with real human life and people, and I feel like I want to I wanna honor that in some way, you know? And to some extent, it's like I feel sorry for them. I kind of identify with, like, you know, the stuff that's just trashed, you know? Like, oh, no one, no one wants this crap, but it's, like, not crap. It's actually pretty good. You just got to figure out how to work with it. This circuit bending documentary follows three different artists and myself uh, at our different stages of circuit bending. Uh, the first one is David Caballo, who teamed up with me on this documentary, and we kind of worked side by side uh, while I was filming and educating myself on the process from scratch to where we are today. Uh, he was also that he had a little bit of experience, uh, but pretty much on the level with me in terms of our knowledge base of electrical engineering. Which I found a cool bend which changed the timbre of the sound. It was a piano sound and then it got a little more, uh, I'd say raspy or maybe like a saw wave, like kind of tremolo. That's all melted together. So I was really excited, discovered a bend and kept on going and shorted it. Fucking thing's dead. And I didn't have such luck with my other toy either, which worked fine. But when I busted it open, it refused to work. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. <sighs> what happened, Caballo? <laughs> hmm. Why don't you use that for the documentary, huh? And then there's Joe Cantrell, who is above and beyond uh, pretty much anyone that I've met in terms of talking to them about how these things work. But let me see what we got here. I mean, we can do a little, some bends. All right, we got a Tonka toy, that's good. He does circuit bending, but circuit bending is just one piece of his much bigger puzzle. Oh, I got a speaking right, read. Nice. Oh, there's this chorus pedal, it has some switches on it, that's been bent. Um, this thing, which I think used to be an octave pedal, put it in a different box. I got this, the speaking math. It's just 
is something he utilizes when he needs to do it in order to manipulate a piece of equipment to get it to where it needs to be so that he can incorporate it in whatever art project that he's working on. So it's in his toolbox. These are the, the successors to the original Speak and Spell. I should probably contact Sarah Rollins. <laughs> and then the third guy is Travis Varga. Travis uh, had no idea what it was. I picked him up. I took him to a thrift store. I had him pick out a toy. And then I brought him back to the workshop here. I walked him through step by step what the whole process was. This was engaging for me because I, I caught myself more focused with taking it apart, with trying different aspects out of the wiring. I learned a lot just from doing like a simple little Fisher-Price keyboard, taking it apart and putting it back together again. And it just reemphasizes that even in this digital age, a lot of the digital devices are still wired together with still just solder and, and speaker wiring. Just doing stuff with your hands again and stuff like that is like, it's refreshing. So in this documentary, you're gonna see me working side by side with David, our trials and tribulations as we started to dig into the world of circuit bending. Uh, you're gonna see all kinds of weird toys. You're gonna to see the inside of all kinds of electronics. Uh, you're gonna hear all kinds of weird noises. Hopefully you come out with a desire to pursue this on your own and also with a little bit of education in terms of what circuitry does, um, at least a little more than you had before you started watching this. We know so little about electricity, like, and it's everywhere. It's this, this thing that gives us all these modern conveniences and enables our art. And I just thought, I want to know more about this and have that inform my art and what I want to do. Back in the day, the circuit bending sort of scene just kind of got associated with, well, let's just say that it, it, it was a scene that valued not taking yourself too seriously, um, which is fine, <laughs> but at that time, I, I wanted to take myself seriously. Uh, word zap. <laughs> All right, hey, well, word zap level one. I was bothered by that as a limitation. If I told people that like, oh yeah, I do circuit bending, they're gonna have, an instant image of what I do that is probably going to be really different than what I actually, you know, what actually comes out of the speakers. There's, uh, You're right. holy shit, I did it. When a friend brought this idea of circuit bending into my life, I thought it was absolutely ludicrous. So of course I was fascinated by it. And as I dug deeper and deeper into it, uh, I was looking around on the internet and I saw a free workshop that was available at a local art museum in San Diego. So I decided to take the class and the instructor had us bend an FM radio. After doing the real simple bend and taking the class, it was taught in such a way that I was hooked right away. Transistor. That's probably the op amp, dude. We might be in good business over here. I like sort of like the DIY aspect of you're just, you're planning out your curriculum and what you want to learn from circuit bending. So, you know, I found out about common things that, that are done. Let's see where that transistor is. These three up here. I don't want to mess with those. One thing I learned early on was that pitch is controlled by resistors. And so, you know, if you increase the resistance on that part of the circuit, then you'll lower the pitch because less electricity is flowing through and it's, it's lower energy. <laughs> and so that's kind of like a pretty interesting piece of knowledge if 
like me making music, pitch is a huge part of what I do. And here's a way that we're, we've been controlling it like for so long and fuck, how could you not incorporate that? How could you not learn that and want to become better through that? So here's a, oh, that's an on off switch. There we go. Solve it. Level. I kind of stopped doing it and I got in, that's, that's when I got more into doing computer stuff where I can like, well, I can just control everything. Um, and that's the only band I've done on it. Um, let's see where the output is. And it's less associated with this kind of, um, kind of goofy circus kind of vibe. Not that there's anything wrong with that, really. <laughs> Reverb in there. Oh, yeah. You can spell in a tunnel. <laughs> this little chorus thing is pretty cool. Um, I basically just um, circuit bent this, and it and it becomes a kind of uh, an oscillator. So there we go. Definitely one of the best things uh, about circuit bending is the fact that I now feel educated about how electronics work. Where before, it hand me a TV remote and I could open that thing up and I honestly would have no idea what's going on inside of that thing. It just looks like this little alien city that you're looking at from above that does all kinds of really handy things. Alright, so that's that thing. <laughs> so, uh, there it is. Without the octopus, it's kind of a lot less interesting. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> Gotta try that one. <laughs> Ow! Keep on touching electricity. You are electricity, bro. That's that's a good point. I think that's kind of how my fascination with junk here, what that grew out of, was kind of not um, not really having much more of a choice. Oh, that's making a sound. And once you start messing with things and seeing like, hey, this, this is really interesting. I want to be able to kind of control what my things do and not have it be absolutely destroyed. Can you imagine if, if there were code built into this thing, for example, you know, as soon as you opened it, <laughs> unless you had some kind of factory authorization, it would just kill itself. <laughs> right? It'd be like, oh, wow, let's see what this band does. Oh, it's on fire. Okay, no, it's dead now. All right. Oh, a siren -y sound. you start messing with stuff and enjoying it and making it your own, you know, if you buy a so piece of software or even a piece of hardware where in the company, that the company doesn't allow you to do it, right? <laughs> Suddenly, uh, your opinion of that kind of uh, um, stuff changes as well. Maybe people you know, can start thinking about these ideas of who owns the thing that you're messing with. Who owns the product that you just bought? Is it you? Because <laughs> uh, if it's not, then maybe that's a problem. Going thrifting in a nicer part of town, hopefully collecting some, some nice goods that, that other people overlooked and are too good for. The hunt is interesting because just like any time you go to a thrift store, you have no idea what you're going to find. Yeah. Nothing, nothing. It's really amazing like how many records got made. Oh, okay, let's see here. 
So this this is this is my life here. <laughs> Three, four, six, oh, eight. Harp, skip, and jump. All right. Hunting is even like the big part of it, like where to hit, right? Like you gotta hit the spot that people don't go to and you have to look at like like kind of like what toys you're into and you don't want something that's too simple because it's not worth you know messing around with and you don't want something that's too complex because then you can't break it open and understand it. First we hit up some thrift stores, found a couple cool gadgets to test this theory of bending the circuits to get a whole new sound. Um, we got a couple things. It is good to do a little research before you do because there are other people out there that are circuit bending and a lot of these toys were really mass produced. So if you have to make the decision of getting one toy or another, it's good to have a little bit of knowledge in terms of, oh, I should buy this one because I know for a fact that this one has a few bends on it. Or you could just go trailblazing and decide to find one that no one has ever done before and open it up and experience for yourself. Actually, you know what, you know what I'll do is I'll just like fast forward this whole thing in the right way onto the new wheel. Backwards. Well, I know it's on this, this uh, reel anyway. You know, in this process, I guess, it seems a little ham-fisted, but you know, we're going for it and that's how it's going to happen. We're going to hunt for something and then, you know, it's going to be traditional circuit bending, really. Going to shop for children's toys that make noise uh, in one way or another is a pretty fun experience. So, you know, you just walk into your store, you look around, you dig, you look in places that you probably wouldn't normally look, spend a couple bucks and come home with some treasures that you're gonna tear apart. I respect like this random nature of circuit bending and that's cool, you know? When everything's so defined and there's so much intent to creating, sometimes the fun is lost. So I think that's, that's good to have like a randomized fun element of it. But eventually like, you know, I wanna gain knowledge about it and to actually realize like what's happening in the circuit so that I can build my own circuits and modify anything I want and create my own instruments. Sometimes you find these things with, that still have the, someone's messages from like 30 years ago. Yeah. You know, it's like this weird little slice into someone's life. So you're gonna spend 10 to 20 bucks at the thrift store on toys that you're gonna tear apart. Uh, half of them are probably gonna be trashed by the time you're done with them and they're not gonna work. We had like, ton of circuit bent things uh, and we're controlling them via this weird genetic algorithm. See how fast I'm doing this? Mm -hmm. If you get a computer to do this like at a thousand, a a thousand times a second, yeah. it becomes something completely different. So this is actually going to a switch and I had this thing called a Minitron. Hook it up to MIDI. I had this connected to a bunch of relays, and relays are uh, electrically controlled uh, switches. So I could basically switch this on and off. I think one thing that's going to help this project move forward is that we have this dedicated space. So whether you have, you know, a corner of your living room or a garage or a dedicated room, even that you could ha have as a workshop, it's a great place to store all the tools on your workbench and have access to all the different components that you're going to need and store any sort of toys that you want. And so we got this workshop set up. It's officially a workshop because we have a shop light. <laughs> <laughs> or I would tend to make, uh, spend most of the time making the software to, to play music and not actually um, practicing in that software. Mm -hmm. um, so it becomes, uh, or it became kind of boring for me in a way. And then we got the setup here, we got a soldering iron at the station with the controllable voltage so you don't burn out the circuit. The soldering iron is something that you're going to use to not only desolder things but to solder all your components together. You're going to want to have a couple different tips available for yourself because there's a few different situations that you're going to run into when it comes to soldering. Mainly you want one that's small because most of the components are small so you're going to want a nice small soldering tip to go on your soldering gun. A little cleaner for the tip, which is better than using the sponge it came with. These helping hands, so you can see what you're soldering or probing. 
Uh, so it holds the thing that you're trying to solder. It can hold the wires for you. And it gives you like four or five extra hands so that you can go in and put the soldering iron in it. And most of them have a magnifying glass in it so you can get a very good look at what you're trying to solder. The most important tools would have to be the test leads or probes. So we have these nails here to touch the leads and create a bridge. And eventually, if we find that does something, then we can connect a component in the middle. These are a little bit big. Um, the problem with that is if you're gonna put this on, on a lead, it might touch the one next to it and create a short. <laughs> so I have a lot of junk sitting around <laughs> and uh, I got tired of having, um, working in the computer and having that much control. So, and plus, you know, you, I spend all day in the computer doing work and doing stuff that I don't want to do necessarily. And the last thing I want to do when I'm like, I want, I want to feel creative. is like going back and looking at, you know, um, a glowing rectangle. So if you have something like a keyboard and you're already using up two hands, probing out your leads, it's near impossible to get a sound. You need a sound to hear before you modify it. Let's try to get one of these clipped on so you have one hand free to play the note and the other one to test. Test probe, a physical device used to connect electronic test equipment to a device under test. Test probes range from very simple, robust devices to complex probes that are sophisticated, expensive, and fragile. A test probe is often supplied as a test lead, which includes the probe, cable and terminating connector. You gotta do some weird Asian chopstick shit like this where you're like pressing the key and then probing out leads going do 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 went back to using just like hardware and I have not turned back. So and I only use stuff that I find that or is used or is broken um or and or obsolete. So stuff that I find at garage sales. Last but not least, smoke extractor. It was uh safety first. So when you are soldering, you're also gonna want something that ventilates the air. I mean, a fan works to be able to blow it out of there. And of course, you're gonna want ventilation in the space that you're in. Yeah, I don't wanna inhale those fumes and cause any reproductive harm. That's the, no, no, we're not doing that. I like this was like, you know, a toy flip phone. The flip part has since come off. So that'll give you an idea of the era <laughs> from which this toy originated. Sometimes when you bend things, they'll, um, <laughs> I'll start working in really weird ways. And I found that out like after I bent this, I really liked the way it sounded. And then I left the batteries in there. The next time I saw it, like the batteries had completely leaked everywhere. So this thing, the bend that's involved in this, like absolutely just destroys batteries. Yeah. Those are the two processors that are covered up in big black blobs. Well, black blobs, some kind of circuit that they protect from like damage or like people copying their shit. I guess first things first, mark off. Remember, think of where the power is so don't fuck with these. So this is all surface. These two come out of the switch. As long as I don't touch these two guys, I'm good. So there's so many screws that hold these things together. So it takes a little bit of time. You got to unscrew them. Once you get them unscrewed, that reveals your circuit board. Once your circuit board is in the open, uh, you need to find your probes and you start to probe the circuit board while you're activating whatever sound that it does. So you start to probe your circuit board while you're activating the sound. And as you're probing while the sound is activated, eventually when you put two probes in a spot, while the sound is activated, you're gonna manipulate the sound in some way. And then you can solder those two points together and just put a cable from one end to the other to continue doing whatever happens when you probe those two points. Or in the middle of that one wire, you can put whatever electrical component you want that manipulates the sound even further. A potentiometer is a popular one. So you find a potentiometer that's right for the situation and then you can turn the dial back and forth to either increase or decrease the amount of electricity that's going through that one point. So let's see what's going on here. I have a capacitor that I have placed on here and the speaker's there. 
but it does not look like the capacitor is doing its job anymore. So let's see, what is the value of this capacitor? It is 100 microfarads. Capacitor, a device that stores electrical energy in an electric field. The physical form and construction of practical capacitors vary widely and many types of capacitors are in common use. Capacitors are widely used to block direct current while allowing alternating current to pass, smooth the output of power supplies, and tune radios to a particular frequency. in there too. Let's see what happens when we pull that resistor out. There's a resistor on here and I wonder what happens. I wonder what happens if we uh, get rid of this resistor. Let's play. No, let's not play. Let's... This is also power so we're gonna stay away from that. I guess everything else is cool. Mic is over here. Mic is up there. The two switches are up here. Don't want his name on. There's a cap here. You would mess with this capacitor. Oh, yeah. man! Super singing! So now the resistor is out of the mix. Information. Can I help you? Can I help you? Wow, this is my new favorite thing. He's never done this before. Pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Certainly glad I got rid of that little resistor. If you put it back, and it'll... yeah. See, it stops. <laughs> Freaking out. <laughs> you look at the circuit and you look at the traces and you try to trace sort of the flow of where everything's going and it's easy to see that you know you either have a chip, a CPU, or it's covered up in the black blob and then sometimes you have another second chip like a analog to digital converter or something and we gotta hear this multiple times today. And so these are hot points where audio is being changed and and so you might connect one of those points and make an extra connection to like a uh, a discrete part like a capacitor or a resistor and so you're making this jump to sort of affect a different change. Sing it. Sing it. Ow. So that's the switch. <laughs> that's all I seem to do is turn shit off. In doing this documentary, I myself decided to dig into it more and more as I was working with the other artists that are featured in this film. And really, it, it's become a part of my day-to-day -day practice. Uh, whether I'm composing something inside of a DAW or just messing around with instruments and trying to make unique sounds to sample, it really is just a, a great and unique way to create something that it really does individualize whatever you're trying to create. So what I'm doing is I'm bypassing the, um, there's a resistor in there um, that's set to a fixed amount. When I took it out, it did that, that craziness, which is awesome. I did an awesome craziness. Um, but I'm curious as to whether changing the value of that resistor using a potentiometer, which is basically a variable resistor, 
uh, will give us um, some other interesting effects. Potentiometer, a three terminal resistor with a sliding or rotating contact that forms an adjustable voltage divider. Potentiometers are commonly used to control electrical devices such as volume controls on audio equipment. So I'm going to change it to, that was a 5k resistor which is pretty, which is a pretty median value. And I'm going to change it to um, higher resistance that, oh, there's 100k. So this is a way higher value of resistance. And we'll see what that does. Ah, so now I can kind of control it. And that's the randomized sort of part of it. You might be, you know, giving the circuit too much power. You might, it might be underpowered. And, and so you get a lot of really weird effects. It's doing something it's not intended to do. The idea is to sort of gain knowledge from that and then to have intent and knowledge and to do something like, to create something like that. Reverse engineering to engineer, I suppose. We're gonna try to have fun in the lab doing these bends, but at the same time, we're gonna try to pair that with some real learning. While you're creating something, you're also getting an education on how the electrical components react with the circuit board when you decide to put them in the middle of a bend. So whether you're using a capacitor or a potentiometer, when you find a bend, you know, you're learning what that is doing to an electrical signal. Put the resistor back on. So the next thing I'm really curious as to whether um, uh, the, the actual contact with the uh, human fingers is affecting what's going on here. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be having quite the same effect. I can just glue it in there and then just cut out um, some space um, here maybe. Wow, so two things. Uh, clearly the uh, the resistor is controlling uh, uh, the speed, uh, or helping to control the speed. So the higher the resistance value, the faster it's going to go. That's why the, like this thing, uh, when I turn it up, suddenly it goes really fast, right? And then I can crank it down, and it, it'll repeat. Right? So that's that thing, like, displaying itself, like, incredibly fast. And then... Um, start turning it down and it gets slower, um, but there's still, it's still connected. When I disconnect it, then it's got no relation to whatever limit of speed, it starts going slower and slower and slower and slower. Which of course is awesome. So, <laughs> I'd like to have both of these options in here. It really is harmless, you're not going to electrocute yourself, it's DC power. You know, unless you're working on something that is plugged into the wall, then you're in danger zone. But, you know, if it's just a couple, one or two AA batteries, it, it's not going to hurt you. Look for some switches. It's a momentary. It's not what I want. I'm looking for um, a single pole. That might work. Switch, an electrical component that can disconnect or connect the conducting path in an electrical circuit, interrupting the electric current or diverting it from one conductor to another. When a pair of contacts is touching current can pass between them, while when the contacts are separated no current can flow. Going to put the potentiometer in there backwards and uh, and point it out the back where the speaker used to be so i'm going to need 
uh, to drill a hole. Okay, cool. So this is mounted in there. Good. The toy is a Phonics Frog Pond that I bought at, from someone's garage on Craigslist. And so, you know, speaking spells, that sort of thing, they're, they're older and a lot of people have already bent them and taken them off the market. So now we have the new versions of stuff like Leapfrog Phonics. So this is the frog, phonics, frog pond, or what have you. Try pressing any letter. R, 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 You know, you're constantly like pushing this. Then you shouldn't have to do that. And then the idea of like building a mod would be like building like an LFO circuit that would oscillate, that would just keep on pressing it on and off. So you wouldn't have to do it, but you'd get a fucking wave to do it for you. It was cool. Right away, I kind of found, you know, a couple of different triggers on the keyboard panels. And just it was interesting to see how, because I had never done something like this. You take it apart and you put it back together a different way. And it, you can kind of make a whole new instrument. Now where to put the switch? This is a kind of a bulky switch. Yep. So the speaker outs are good. When I first opened up Frog, Phonics Frog Pond, I had discovered like a pitch bend for like the alphabet mode. And I got really excited because um, it sounded really weird. Look at this hall. This is all the wire I need and more. Yummers! And I mainly went out from the main CPU, so I figured that's where the action was going on, and tried to stay away from what looked like power leads, and you know, I would just kind of go around to other resistors, so because of that pitch controlling resistor that I found, I was like, yeah, you know, resistors are probably a good bet. Resistor, a two-terminal electrical component that implements electrical resistance as a circuit element. Used to reduce current flow, adjust signal levels, divide voltages, and terminate transmission lines, among other uses. Resistors are common elements of electrical networks and electronic circuits and are ubiquitous in electronic equipment. And so each one of these bends is off of the main CPU and connected to some other separate resistor. Basically took it apart and rerouted some wiring inside of it on the motherboard panel, I guess I'd call it. And there's a bunch of different inputs that the speaker wire can go into. And you basically are just rerouting the speaker wires until you hit something that gives you a sound or gives you a warping of a current sound.
So you might get lucky and find a circuit board that has five or ten bends even on the one circuit board. And once you have them all mapped out and kind of loosely wired in, then you can go in and solder everything together, make it nice and tight. And you can either try and put everything back inside its original box, or you can design a new box with the circuit board and all your dials, knobs, and switches inside of it as well. <laughs> I want it to fucking work, and I want it right now. Uh, instead of being like, okay, let's actually think about what the best way to actually implement this is and go ahead and do that. I'm like, nope, nope, nope. What's the fastest, <laughs> the fastest, cheapest way I can do it to make it work right now? Part of the thing about circuit bending too is like, you know, the more patience you have, the better your circuit bend is going to be. Um, I tend to have very little, very little patience. I'm like, yes, I want it to be done so I can fucking use it, you know? And so you do it, and it's like, it works, but it's really slapdash, and it like breaks really easy. Right. Like this one. <laughs> so it was cool. We ended up with like a little new knob, and I get to do a couple little filtering uh, resonance effects with one of the keys on the board. So that was kind of the whole from start to finish, and now I have a neat little instrument souvenir that I can mess around with and just know that I kind of created a, a new instrument off something that already was in existence. It's pretty cool, very cool experience. So one of the bends that I did that's probably one of my more favorite was definitely the pink microphone. I mean, it had maybe five bends on it on a very small space. I mean, I had circuit boards that were like this big that I didn't find anything on. And this was a circuit board about this big and I kept finding bends. It was really neat to go in and to be able to put multiple switches in these places and solder one or two points to different places and really make some really grimy, nasty sounds that I really do enjoy. So I think it was part of like a Tonka toy truck set. So you can have these like impact wrench sound. No, that's not an impact. I guess this is. There we go. Mm -hmm. There's the impact wrench. Pew, pew. And like a little horn. Like a voice that's not working. Crank it up. Oh, there's the timing so I can make it really fast. <laughs> right, suddenly it's like pew, pew, pew. <laughs> and I added a jack to it as well. A lot of these things are designed, we played with little toy sets with little tiny speakers when you plug them into to actual speakers are like, they sound different than you would expect them to when they originally were working. Because most of these toys just have little speakers on them. So you cut those speaker wires and instead of having a speaker, you put an eighth inch jack so that you can plug in an eighth inch plug and then source it out to a mixing board or your computer or whatever you want to record to sample it so that it's the best possible quality audio being sent out to whatever you want to use. Electrical connector, an electromechanical device used to join electrical conductors and create an electrical circuit. The connection may be removable, require a tool for assembly and removal, or serve as a permanent electrical joint between two points. Thousands of configurations of connectors are manufactured for power, data, and audiovisual applications. Well, if you're sampling it inside of your computer, you can record it straight into your computer from a 3.5 jack. And once you have maybe two or three of these toys that have, you know, three or four bends each on them, you can hook those all into one mixing board and then really start playing around and adding reverb effects and whatever you really want to create some really interesting sounds. I think he's saying late caller on the way. The batteries might be kind of dying too. There's the, ouch, the plug. See that, that that's what's on the other side of the, that black thing. It's just like a tiny custom made chip and then all the leads coming out. 
So that is that is what the blob actually is. It's it's more orderly than it seems. This is a piece of metal and it has one it's on a springy thing. And so both of these are connected. So two sides of a circle are connected. If you look at where it where it relates to here, that means that that's probably a ground and it's always connected either that, that or that. Whatever it's due, it's like messing things up and in a, a slow, hypnotic way. And I'm gonna have to figure out how to make music with these. And they're kind of like these slow loops. Yeah, I have four of them. I connected an on-off switch to each of them and it'll kind of play like some weird jumbled up song that's kind of you know kind of major kind of minor kind of weird and dissonant and it's it's kind of slow and lethargic and really weird and it's like I don't I don't really know what's going on but I guess that makes sense that it would be slower if it's some effect due to resistance It was one of the first bends that I did and it, it didn't last very long after it was made, but I was able to sample the sounds that I did make. I still kind of <laughs> am chasing uh, those sounds. Again, I haven't made sounds as cool that touched me as, as, as deeply as the pink microphone did. Uh, so hopefully someday I'll, I'll find something that I can manipulate to make the noises that I really enjoy like that. So this is also a Reed Gazala thing. I mean, all these are, you can trace back down, but like finding a single thing and then looking for other points with which it will react. You know, I found some bends, four or five of them, and, you know, initially, like, I wanted to just wire them up and then also test to see if maybe a component in between might, you know, do something else. Joe is 1-0 on his circuit pants this month, not having a very good week. And the bend is successful. It's not pretty, but it it has worked. I feel a little golf clap. And a lot of times they say you're supposed to, or Reed Gazala says you're supposed to activate it. Um, and make it do what it's supposed to do. And, uh, and then you bend from there. Uh, if you can make it make a sound that it normally would be making, and then you mess with it while it's making that sound. 
sometimes that can be really annoying. Another pretty important thing we did was fucking write down our bends on notebooks. And that way, like, you get so excited in the moment and you're like, I care so much about this right now. But then we gotta go back to work, so I'm probably gonna forget these bends. So we have a little map of the circuit. So I'm gonna take some photos here, like I do every time. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. we, we can pretend. <laughs> Hey man, I went rogue. I was trying to, you know, it was like the parkour of bending. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you fall. Transistor, a semiconductor device used to amplify or switch electronic signals and electrical power. Transistors are commonly used in digital circuits as electronic switches which can be either in an on or off state. Installing some banana jacks with pretty colors. Oh, that's the one I wanted. I can, you know, combine them with these. Each one of these jacks goes to one point. So I'll have one and then I'll have a bunch branching out and I can quickly move the plug from one to the other and maybe they actually, you can actually put one on top. Oh, interesting. And it's colorful and fun. You can see wires hanging out and stuff. positive end of the capacitor here, which is a 100 microfarad capacitor. It's pretty hefty, uh, at least for this thing. Um, and then negative is going to uh, wherever, but specifically to right there, I believe. And yeah, the the time flew by this week because because um, the shit's legit, and we just sat here and forgot about the world and just got into the world of electronics. And that's a great thing. This is not a circuit band thing. It's like a who made these? Uh, there's a guy that makes these at a workshop. It's like, the Tocante. The Tocante. The Tocante. We've got the Leaps Phonics Pond, and today I'm gonna sample through the line out of the jack that I've installed. I'll email this to myself to get into the phone, or I'll use a phone cable and into my preferred music tracker software, Pixie Tracker, to give it a little bit of chiptune flair, and um, I'll build the track there. So I'm chop it down so it's just one cycle, get to a loopable point. The loops themselves are out of tune, so to speak, or a better way to say would be that they're microtonal, which is to say that they're kind of in between the cracks of the keyboard. So the western scale that we're used to doesn't subdivide pitches quite down that far. So it's kind of in between the pitches of what we're used to. Down to the right tempo, still getting cut off. So when 
I want to integrate these loops with other instruments, I'm gonna either have to tune up or down the instruments or digitally do that to the audio from the loop. What I will do is try to pitch down or up the loop to match the other sounds I want in it. So I'll audition, audition other sounds and then I'll try to get it in tune. Go back to the loop and then I'm able to change the pitch of it. I'm going to pitch it down. That sounds decent. I find it challenging to use the bends that I've found because these loops just sound really weird. Not anything that I would ever intentionally come up with. Got a second pick in there for the flavor. can be kind of challenging uh, working with circuit bent sounds because they're unpredictable. Doesn't seem to be exactly the same each time that you record it. I've learned new methods to make music along the way and it's cool to use the circuit bent sounds in all sorts of different ways. Circuit bending, it's, it's not just one thing. It's really just this crazy other world, this sinkhole that you, you're gonna just find yourself in. Sounds. That could be good. There, there are no rules, you know? The toy's dying, it has a limited life, and then it changes every time. You know, it's just a cool way to embrace the randomness. For me, like, there are always parameters and limits that inspire creativity and just make you work harder within. What was it that? Ooh. This is like a broken reel-to-reel -reel player. I can actually pull this up. So I'm just taking that output and putting it into here. And there's no tape in it. It's just, it's messed up in a way that it makes this noise. And when you start to alter the, um, the volume, it'll start to change its timbre. So it's like a really nice kind of a, a drone toy right. that it can sort of ride and, and you know, combine with other things. This is like a, a crappy multi-effects guitar pedal. And I put it in feedback with the rest of the in, the, in the amp, so the output is going into um, the input and vice versa. You know, I grew up playing piano and then one day I saw like fucking guitarists electric guitarist with pedals and and I realized like damn I gotta I gotta learn synthesis you know to get on those people's levels where they're unlocking all this stuff that's kind of what I want circuit bending to do for me I think get this kind of really stony yeah totally so I can take my broken tape player here um, you know just some other sounds along with it. I mean, the wireless revolution that you know Steve Jobs wants is still far away, but it is getting closer. But it's um, interesting to see that it's still a lot of stuff relies on that, on that technology. And um, you can also do stuff with like guitar pedals. This is a um, this is actually kind of a nice guitar pedal that I ruined by, by circumventing it. Um, I didn't ruin it, I, I improved it. But it does these really nice, all by itself, let's do this. Everything in our life, in one way or another, is 
benefiting from a circuit board in some way. So the most simple things to some of the most sophisticated things that we do are all based on some sort of electrical circuit. It's a huge industry that probably does already have, you know, people that are even sometimes on the radio that we know about that, that mess with this kind of stuff. But I think it's just gonna even get potentially more into the mainstream or just the knowledge will grow, which I hope the documentary would, will do, because uh, even if you're not artistic, it is just a cool thing to know how stuff works, basically. And this, is, this helps you gauge how a lot of our electronics work. And I just put it in feedback with the rest of the, and they start interacting with each other. So I have a certain measure of control, but there's also, you know, um, an aspect of this that I don't have. Um, they kind of do what they want sometimes, um, and I can suggest certain things that they should do. <laughs> And sometimes they'll do that and sometimes not. So it's almost like kind of a collaboration or a, a cooperation, I guess. Right, so this is the kind of thing that I've um, been getting into in terms of the performance. And my um, circuit bent stuff um, kind of um, goes along with that and gets mixed into to the mix. And for the most part, I would say 90% of the population has absolutely no clue how any of this stuff works. And it's not like this technology is going anywhere. It's only gonna get more sophisticated and more and more things in our life are gonna be completely controlled by electricity flowing through it. Eventually, like, I don't see it as like creating like the super instrument or like the super circuit or whatever. Like, you know, I embrace kind of like getting into the nitty-gritty of these little things like you know these these little entities and you know i i kind of want to not so much like i want to have more intent with it so so that i'm expanding the capabilities of something um and you know there's a lot of sound a lot of different things that you know you could do a lot of sounds that can be harvested from for example things that are unstable, you know, things that are random and unstable. I mean, definitely more of a analog to hybrid with wires and stuff, um, because, it, because it would be interesting to see how, I guess the more options the instrument has, the more it can, in theory, create. That's kind of, I think, would be my best bet with like just be getting a lot of like electric keyboards and then modular synths and stuff like that and just like stacking them up and then kind of like plugging in, plugging out, kind of what, they are, what are, they're doing a lot now still, but it's just more already built, you know? So doing the building, you could really find like, potentially sounds that no one's heard before. I mean. pushed away the nagging memories of her parents' car hurt them off the side of the cliff. She pushed the thought away from her and turned to Mark. Love me. Love me. I do, darling.
mean, circuit bending in 50 years is probably going to be just as cool as it is now, except I'm looking at toys that I played with 20 years ago, and I'm just now educating myself on how those things are. So the kids that are playing with the sophisticated computer toys that are coming out nowadays may someday be shopping for the 20 year old laptop computer or tablet that they're using now uh, to tear that apart and manipulate it in some way. I could see a lot of stuff being without cables and stuff. So it could almost be more of like a, like film is today when it's really set aside for like the auteurs who really want to like get in hard and it, it'll set apart actually people that are really good at it and then some of that are just mediocre. I'm sort of like trying to gain experience playing with these crazy unstable random toys and eventually want to bring this knowledge to modifying Casio keyboards you know, other, and you know, making keyboards out of weird toys, maybe. Me making my own custom keyboards. And yeah, maybe save this one for later. The circuit boards that exist on the toys for children nowadays are far more sophisticated than the toys that I'm manipulating uh, when I buy them from a thrift store, so it's going to get interesting to say the least. This in 50 years will be like, they'll just be probably some pretty crazy inventions from, uh, from people that just were going in deep and were like, whatever, I'm not even going to, I don't need to get with the times because that I know what that offers, like this is kind of like still in the dark, even though it's almost been bypassed on to the next one. But the people that are really gonna be diving deep, they're gonna be coming up with stuff that, you know, probably a whole new tonal structures. Shrinking them down from big things you would have on stands to like a pocket-sized keyboard that has everything that you want it to make, you know, all kinds of music, and it's just big enough, just it's tiny and efficient, and you go anywhere with it and make just all kinds of wacky music. And I want like hundreds of these. That's, that's the long-term goal. Probably replicas of remodulated things that are just like, like whole new instruments, I guess. Whole new uh, ways to play music. So, yeah. Like if you don't make your own instrument, you're not going to be a good musician, basically? <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah, definitely. Like the people that are making their own things, yeah, will stand, stand the test of time. I believe that Louis and B.B. Barron, when they worked on their the soundtrack to Forbidden Planet. Um, Louis Barron would make these crazy circuits and he did all, made all these oscillators himself, but um, a lot of the stuff they made was really unstable and they would make noise for a certain amount of time and then they would just die. I have to find the scholarship on this. I'm not sure if this is, this might be bullshit, but I like the idea um, that they began to sort of regard their little electronic uh, mechanisms as kind of like little living beings. They would they would kind of come into being and live a little bit and then they would destroy themselves. They would die because they really weren't built correctly and they would just eventually blow up. Um, but they would record them as they were, we were doing them. So circuit bending is a fun experience. It really is a fascinating way to kind of just open up a piece of electronics and you know, enjoy an afternoon kind of playing with this stuff. So just kind of like knowing how to make fire, this is kind of like a modern way of knowing how to make fire of that kind of survival skill because now that we're not living in caves, now that we're not living out there, we have this silicon based landscape. And so, you know, this is like us sort of, you know, learning the lay of the land, the new land. It's really just good harmless fun and a great way to learn about the stuff that's just all around us and makes our lives you know magical on a day-to-day -day basis so it's a fun way to learn how the magic trick kind of works you know because it's it's fun and it's rewarding and to put in work and and to make something cool and unique so I kind of I kind of like that idea and circuit bending maybe kind of echoes that a little bit that um, it is kind of like a, a, you're kind of interfering with a, a sort of a life cycle. 
uh, and a lot of times the bends will kind of, you know, they'll shorten the life of whatever it is. So it is a, you know, in many ways, kind of a live fast, die young approach to, to electronics. <laughs> um, but the rewards are great, um, right? So there you go.